the 12th chapter of the Hebrew letter, beginning in verse 23, we read these words, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The writer penned this letter to a group of believers amid what seems to them a great catastrophe. Their entire lives had been upended by the gospel of grace. All of their lives had been wrapped up in the law and the covenant of Moses. And in their eyes, it made them a superior race. It gave them a perfect creed. They had tenaciously clung to the law and the temple and all that they represented until it was their life. It was their identity. And in following Christ, it was difficult to cross the bridge and to leave that world behind. They looked at Jerusalem as the holy city. The temple on Mount Zion was an imposing symbol of the fact that God was the God of the Jews. Moses was the greatest of all prophets. The Jewish race was the supreme race. Jerusalem was the supreme city. And the temple was the supreme cathedral of the living God. Those were the basic theological beliefs of the Hebrew. But now every one of those ingrained dogmas was being shaken. The temple had already been shaken when Christ died upon Mount Calvary, just outside the city wall. For when he died, you'll recall that an earthquake shook the land and the hand of God had ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom, at last opening the way to God. A prophet greater than Moses had now arisen. He had now offered his kingdom to all kindreds, tongues, and nations. He had made men and women of all colors, tongues, and tribes to be equal in Christ. He had replaced the old covenant that they had lived under for so long with one that was new and one that was better in every way. But now the storm clouds were gathering over the long home of their faith. The city of Jerusalem, for now, even the city would fall and the holy temple would be destroyed. Well, you have to try to imagine how that must have felt to the Jews, even to those who had believed in Christ and followed him. To the Jew living in that time, it must have seemed as though his world was crumbling around him. And the ancient tree of his faith was being shaken, and everything he had known all of his life was falling on every side. It presented a challenge to the faith and the courage of these unsteady Christians. You know, it's always difficult to look beyond our immediate circumstances and to see the larger picture. As times change, as traditions are forgotten, as time-tested institutions are assailed, and as the world as we have known it slips away and we face an unknown future, it's very easy in all of that to become dismayed and to lose heart. To these troubled brethren of the first century, the apostles' message was that when the shaking was over, when the things that could be shaken had fallen, there would remain some things that could not be shaken. And you know the same assurance is offered to Christians even today. The nations, kingdoms, and empires of this world, no matter how great and mighty they may be at one time, they will all crumble. They will one day be a footnote in history. The things around us will be shaken. But there are things that will always remain, and we need to remember that that's where our faith and allegiance should belong. The Hebrew writer here speaks of the great transitions of time as shakings, and he speaks of two great shakings that have taken place that each marks the beginning of a new era of time and a new administration of things. He refers to the law being given to Moses on Mount Sinai. You recall that this caused a literal shaking of the ground. In verse 26, he reminds them that when God gave the law to Moses on the mountaintop, that his voice then shook the earth. And this initiated a new dispensation 
which was marked by a literal earthquake when God spoke to Moses. But then he says, but now hath he promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Well, this is a quotation from the prophet Haggai during the building of the second temple. The prophet's sermon to ancient Israel reads like this in Haggai 2, beginning in verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. This is a magnificent prophecy concerning the temple and its ultimate messianic fulfillment. Haggai is encouraging the rebuilding of the destroyed temple, but in so doing he is pointing with a prophetic finger to its antitype to come one day, and that is the spiritual temple that Christ would build, which is his church. He says that there would be one last shaking. In other words, there would be one last transition in the plan of God for his people on the earth. Now the temple they were building at that time was the replacement to Solomon's temple, which had been destroyed when Israel was carried off to Babylon. The second temple would not equal the beauty or the grandeur of the first temple, even with the costly and ornate renovations later brought about by Herod. It would still pale in comparison to what Solomon built. It would, for one thing, lack the Shekinah glory. But Haggai says that that's all right because this temple would not be permanent, that it too would be shaken and it would one day fall. And in its place would stand the permanent temple of God, not a temple made with stone and precious metal and jewels, but a spiritual and an everlasting temple that the Messiah would build on Mount Zion. This of course would not be a literal building, but would be a spiritual house where God would dwell with his people. It would be the Lord's kingdom. It would be the Lord's church, the church of Jesus Christ. And all of the nations of the earth would come into this temple and worship and God's glory would forever fill it. Well, that's what the Hebrew writer speaks of in our text. He speaks of this one last shaking when the Mosaic covenant, its laws, its priesthood, its animal sacrifices, its tabernacle, its temple, its yearly atonement would all be taken away. They were temporary. And the Christians to whom he writes this letter were, address, were to mature in their faith to the point that the shaking of those things that had been so important to them would not shake their faith in Christ. He says, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. You know, tonight our faith is not being challenged by the removing of the old covenant or the destruction of Herod's temple. But we today look about us and we see the temporary things of earth being violently shaken and we wonder what this means for us. We wring our hands over the future of America, for example, or political unrest around the globe. We watch too much news. We see the looming threat of terrorism or the advance of socialism and communism and other isms that we view as a threat to our peace and our safety and our welfare. And the message to the Christian today is the same as it was to the Christians living in the first century. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Folks, stop fearing what will happen in the world and rather fear the one who holds the world in his hand. The writer says that the things uh, that uh, the writer says the things that when the time that when time has toppled all of those things that we th think of is so important. The things that remain are unshakable, and that which still stands and will forevermore stand is the kingdom of our Christ. It is an unshakable kingdom. We're not waiting for it to appear. It's here. It's a spiritual kingdom that began when Jesus ascended to the Father and took his seat at the right hand of God and was given all power and authority. And the Bible tells us that kingdom will never be destroyed. We should take heart when we read the prophecy that is recorded in the book of Daniel chapter 2 when the Israelites were in captivity 
King Nebuchadnezzar, you recall, had the dream that the prophet Daniel was called to interpret. And he dreamed of this great and this formidable image with a head of fine gold, its chest and arms made of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And then he saw a stone cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then it tells us that the rest of the image crumbled and was crushed and blown away by the wind until not a trace was left. Well, Daniel was called to interpret the king's dream. And he began in verses 37 through 38 by saying, You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power, strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell are the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens. He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. And then he goes on to describe the succession of mighty empires that would arise and rule down through the next several hundred years, culminating in the rise of the Roman Empire. Those empires were rich. They were powerful. They were influential within their own rights. They seemed unstoppable. But those empires, we know, were all destroyed thousands of years ago. And you know there's not a kingdom on the face of this earth that will not wax and then wane and that will not at some point lie in the dust heap of history if time stands long enough. Daniel says they would all come to naught. But notice in verse 44 when he comes to the last of these great world powers, the Roman Empire, he says that in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. No other kingdom would be compared to it. And no other power would conquer it. No earthly power, nor even the power of Satan and his kingdom, could or will ever destroy it. We have received a kingdom which cannot be moved in its capital we would do well to remember is not in Washington, D.C. It is not in London, England or Beijing, China. It's not in Kabul, Afghanistan. It's not even in the city of Jerusalem. It's in the New Jerusalem. It's in the heaven above. And for 2,000 years, Satan has hurled his fiery darts at her and world powers have sought to crush her. But yet the kingdom of our Lord, the church of his Christ, still stands and ever will. It is an unshakable kingdom. And that's where your faith needs to be placed today and not in the kingdoms of this world. We've got Christians who are up with their eyeballs in politics today. And they're obsessed with watching the news and they're wringing their hands about what's going on in the world. What we need to be concerned about is advancing the kingdom of Christ. It's an unshakable kingdom because it has an unshakable king. When Jesus came to earth, Christ could not be overcome by any power, not the least of which is death. And if he could conquer death, the greatest and most tenacious enemy of all mankind, then he holds power over all other forces. And make no mistake, despite the seeming chaos and upheaval that we see in the world today because of sin, don't you doubt that Christ is sitting firmly on his throne. The governments of men are fragile and are constantly being shaken. And even our own government is being shaken, it seems. But Christ and his kingdom cannot be shaken. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28, that King Jesus is putting all enemies under his feet. He broke the penalty of sin at Calvary. He broke the power of sin in his resurrection. He is breaking the hold of sin as souls find freedom from their sin in the gospel. And with every soul that submits to him and obeys him, his kingdom continues to spread into every nation and into the furthest reaches of earth from heart to heart and from person to person until when he at last comes again and the dead are raised, Paul so beautifully says that the last and great enemy of all mankind, death, will finally be destroyed. And having put down all of the rule and power, Paul said he will then deliver that kingdom up to God, that God may be all in all. Folks, I have much more faith in that king than I do any president prime minister, our monarch. I have more confidence in that kingdom than I do the United States, the United Kingdom, the United Nations, or whatever other powers unite upon whatever premise and for whatever objective. Kings come and go, and kingdoms rise and fall, but King Jesus reigns evermore, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Isaiah chapter 9 
and verse 7. And lastly, that the kingdom of Christ not only is an unshakable kingdom because it has an unshakable king, but it also has an unshakable constitution. That the constitution which upholds and guides a nation fails, the nation will fail. But the constitution of Christ's everlasting kingdom is the new covenant which the Hebrew writer shows is a permanent and a lasting covenant. Its premises and its promises better than the covenant of old made with Moses. The things of Moses were shaken and were removed, but the new covenant which came by Christ Jesus stands. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Matthew 24 and verse 35. If you go to Washington, D.C. tonight, you'll find the Constitution of the United States signed by the founders encased in glass and protected, and the government is to operate by it. Its citizens are protected by it. But one day that piece of paper will turn to ash. The constitution of Christ's kingdom, the New Testament scriptures, however, will stand forever and not one word of it is passed away or become irrelevant, outdated, or lost its significance. And if it stands forever, so will the kingdom that it upholds and the king who rules it in righteousness. And we'd better be more concerned about what it says than any earthly document. The kingdoms of men are passing away, but the kingdom of Christ will withstand the fires of earth and the fires of God's eternal judgment. Are you part of that kingdom tonight? Is that where your faith is placed tonight? Is that where your future is all bound up tonight? When every nation of man has crumbled and when the earth itself is dissolved, the kingdom of Christ will stand and be delivered up to God in heaven and God will be all in all. Nothing can destroy it. Nothing can thwart God's purpose. Persecution only fans the flames of its zeal. It cannot be done away with. Jesus and his everlasting kingdom is the only unchanging and indestructible force that there is. And how foolish it is to place your hopes and your confidences in the kingdoms of this earth and in the things of this earth. Become a part of Christ's kingdom today. Bow to King Jesus and submit to his will. Let him take his throne in your heart and be the monarch of your life and of your heart and be part of a kingdom that will never, ever be destroyed.